everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the meeting with and to the reading um, of Lance Olsen, whom I will introduce in a second, but the good custom is to have a little story. And actually, we do have a little story. The story is that um, ever since I started doing this, which is a long time ago, it was in a previous century, in a previous <laughs> millennium too, um, I had known about Professor Olson and his early book, Eclipse of Uncertainty, which was one really, one of the other really important books on uh, postmodern fantastic. So, yeah, he was a big personal narrator, and in 1993 I went to graduate school in Washington State. I had no idea where he was. Um, Washington State University is literally 12 miles from the border with Idaho, Moscow, Idaho. Um, two years later I came back here, literally two weeks after I came back here to Poland. I online, there were times when there weren't so many websites online, I found his email address and it said University of Idaho. So all this time he was 15 miles away from me and I could have taken courses from him because the university has actually cross-listed courses. But eventually we did get to meet years later and now, of course, you don't have to wait um, you know, for that long to meet Professor Olsen. Um, Professor Olsen is a contemporary writer who has been associated with a whole bunch of really sexy um, uh, labels, postmodern. He's one of the culprits responsible for post-postmodern <laughs> label, experimental, avant-garde, avant-pop, all of these together in separation. He's the author of 12 novels that are absolutely wild, both in terms of what they are like, in terms of stories, but also what they look like as objects, and some of them are literally objects rather than just simple books. Um, voluminous uh, criticism on a broad uh, spectrum of topics from postmodern fiction to science fiction, uh, contemporary fiction. Um, he, as I mentioned, he uh, taught at the University of Idaho for the last ten, eight, nine years. Um, so Idaho for ten and then... No, no. He's been at the University of Utah in Salt Lake uh, City. For the last 14 years, he has been uh, the chair of the board of directors. He's the main guy, in other words, of Fiction Collective 2, which is probably the most important experimental fiction publishing house in the United States and probably in the world. Among uh, he's been one of the primary movers of an equally famous and now literary festival that gathers uh, essentially all important experimental avant-garde uh, writers and critics every two years. Mm -hmm. And he's also, he's won, uh, he's won more awards than I can count, so he's the winner of our Science Fiction Research Association's Pioneer Award for the Best Essay. He was the winner three years ago of the uh, Berlin Prize Fellowship, and this year he is um, the recipient, the fellow in the DAAD uh, fellowship in Berlin, and that's why we are lucky enough to have him here. And I could go on for a very long time, but I think he's a much more interesting figure than I am, so I will hand over. Welcome. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this afternoon. And uh, Pavel, great, great to finally see you after all this time. And Carolina, who was just here, wanted to thank her, too, um, for putting all this together and, and making it happen. Um, and as well, the uh, American Studies Colloquium series. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk for about 60 minutes, 50, 60 minutes, um, show you some stuff, and then open things up to questions. So first, what I want to do is to introduce or maybe reintroduce you to this idea, oh, I have a microphone. How does that work? Oh, is yeah. that good? Cool. Um, I suddenly feel more powerful. Nope, it just went off. Now I feel less powerful. OK. Um, over the next 90 minutes or so, so I'll first introduce or reintroduce you to this notion of um, historiographic metafiction. And then uh, I'll introduce you to three of, of the novels that I have worked on that have engaged in some way with this notion of historiographic metafiction. 
And then, um, and, and the first one of those is, is Nietzsche's Kisses, which came out in 2006. The second is going to be a novel called Theories Forgetting, which appeared in 2014. And then there's an ongoing thing, a novel that you walk through, called There's No Place Like Time, which opened at a gallery uh, this past November in Berlin. And then finally, like I say, just open things up to questions, anything you guys want to talk about, um, questions you might have about what I've said or, or what's going on in the U.S. and lit, um, the avant-garde, whatever. Um, so first of all, let me uh, make sure this is all working. Yes, good, okay. So um, there was a, a critic whose name was Linda Hutchian, and Linda Hutchian in the late 1980s began to use this term historiographic metafiction. Um, to refer to self-conscious narratives aware of the myriad obstacles um, in our path whenever we try to construct either personal or cultural history. Um, that is, the fictions that are aware of how events and subjectivities are continuously being written and rewritten and edited and erased and reformatted and retold. And she focused on primarily American texts like Robert Hoover's The Public Burning and Yale Doctorow's Ragtime, very, very famous text from the, the chief folks on from the 60s, 70s, very early 80s. Um, the one could quickly add a list of narratives by people like Julian Barnes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Umberto Eco, Salman Rushdie, Kurt Vonnegut, and, and so on. Um, the, the point is, though, that historiographic metafiction then is self-reflexive, not about the past particularly, but about the problematization of historical knowledge. So the idea of um, how we tell the past and what our relationship to the past is, who's telling the past, how they're telling the past, and raising that to a level of self-consciousness in the fiction itself. And therefore, it's, it's about the problematization of, of knowledge, period, right? So in a sense, then, reading an example of it becomes an education in not knowing certain things, um, and perhaps even a parable about what it is to read in the, in the first place. But I'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, and I found the, the idea really useful when thinking about my own work and answering questions about uh, my own work. Um, I keep returning to this idea of pastness and the troubling relationship um, the present always has with respect to it. And so um, I first, as an undergraduate, uh, met Nietzsche's work uh, via Walter Kaufmann's extraordinary anthology of translations and have been captivated um, both by his work and also the multiplicity of Nietzsche's um, behind it ever since. And in 2003, I began to research uh, both the work and, and the philosopher, the person, um, reading most of his stuff, um, sifting through the biographies, but also coming over uh, to Europe and retracing his sort of life steps um, through Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. And the result was um, this novel called Nietzsche's Kisses, which is the narrative of an, uh, a night in August 1900 when Nietzsche uh, died. He was locked in a small room uh, on the top floor of what would become called the Nietzsche Archives in Weimar. And in the novel, he hovers between dream and wakefulness uh, in a kind of um, memory and hallucinations, and also between the first person, the second person, and the third person points of view. Um, the first person point of view sections have to do with the present, the second ha uh, person point of views have to do with the, the hallucinations that he's undergoing, um, and the third person point of views have to do with him trying to narrate his own past um, as, as he's in the process of, of dying. And I want to start off by just reading you a little bit from this, uh, about 10 minutes or so, just give you a little sense of um, one of the opening first person sections and then um, one of the opening third-person sections, just so you get a, a, a feel of what that's about. And so, what I shall do next is this. I shall undertake 
the opening of my eyes. Like this, yes, like this, there they go, the great extravagance. And there is a dark shape fluttering back and forth in front of me, a huge black insect against the bright white window. A woman, I am fairly sure, a diminutive woman moving. She steps out of the glare, draws alongside my bed, and the damp sheets are off me, her hands between my legs. She works diligently, although my sense of touch isn't what it used to be. Massaging, conceivably, or conceivably scrubbing. Yes, that's it. She hums to herself, something sodden and German by Schubert, looking familiar, looking very familiar, her long gray hair piled in a frizzy bun, purple cobwebs spun across her raw cheeks, scrubbing. Are you perhaps my mother, I ask, breaking the silence, mouth all slurry. She doesn't look up. Then, voila, the crook-shelled apparition withdraws a bedpan from what appears to be a sizable hole in the mattress between my legs and divines its liquid contents before releasing a small, winged smile into the humidity. It's Alvina, Fritz, she says, smiling. Do you know me? Of course I know you, I respond, slow and slurry, studying her features. You've been with us, you've been with the family since I was Vittorio. Vittorio, she asks. Vittorio Emanuel, yes, obviously. She lowers the bedpan. They're back then, she asks. A little. And what did they tell you? Oh, well, you know this and that. She consults the harsh window, the harsh door. I know, I say. I'm sorry. Listen to me, she says, turning back. You're Fritz this afternoon, Fritz. You were Fritz yesterday afternoon. And tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, you will be Fritz again. Are you hungry? Your sister is coming by. She's bringing visitors. You need to eat. A bowl of cabbage soup? A bowl of cabbage soup and slice of bread? I've baked some fresh. While contemplating the question, it occurs to me there is a woman standing in the room. I beg your pardon, I say, but your name is Alvina, Fritz. Alvina. Do you want to know a secret, Alvina, Fritz, Alvina? If you don't eat, do you know what your sister will do, she asks. I look up at the ceiling. She will accuse Alvina of not feeding her Fritz. Do you want to get Alvina into trouble? I look up at the ceiling, then lower my gaze to this person who, for some reason, strikes me as someone you can trust. I whisper to her, every sentence is a kiss. What? Every sentence is a kiss, I repeat louder, and every paragraph an embrace. She stands there watching the show called Friedrich, then raises her bedpan like a Sunday roast on a serving tray, turns, and careful not to spill a drop of me, makes her way toward the door. Fritz, she says over her shoulder, Fritz, what are we going to do with you? A good question. The door opens. The universe pauses. The door clicks shut. Everywhere, wind surging into cognition. Everywhere, noise without end. So shortly after I finished um, Nietzsche's Kisses, I moved to Salt Lake City and a new job at the University of Utah where I met earthwork artist Robert Smithson's writings and his best known piece, The Spiral Jetty, um, which I'll be talking about now for a couple of minutes, both of which, both of his writings and The Spiral Jetty itself, um, deeply influenced my novel, Theories of Forgetting. So Smithson is the guy on the right here with the bad Elvis haircut, and on the left is his partner, Nancy Holt, who herself is a photographer and earthwork artist. <coughs> and
And this is an aerial shot of the spiral jetty, which is a, a piece of, of land art that lies on the north shore of the Great Salt Lake, about a two-hour drive north from where I now work. I visited it for the first time with several graduate students while teaching Mark Danielewski's amazing book, House of Leaves. I wanted to ask them to think a little bit, a little bit about the notion of the labyrinth, which I'll talk about in just a second. <clears throat> His text, if you're not familiar with it, is a kind of physical labyrinth that you have to navigate in, in certain ways. And it was an incredibly generative space, um, going out to the spiral jetty. Um, within just a couple minutes of, of bringing the students there, they were sitting down and writing, or they were taking photographs, or they were videoing, or um, you know, chatting it up about, about the space. It's amazing. It's, it's a kind of... Um, pilgrimage from Salt Lake City. You start out on a highway, you go to two lane roads, you go to one lane road, um, finally the roads end in the last 16 miles, you need to have a four wheel drive um, to get across the desert. If you go the wrong way, it's like you, you see nothing for the rest of your lives. And, and if you, um, you know, bump into one other person while you're out there during the whole day, you feel like it's, it's incredibly um, crowded. And, and I couldn't get it out of my head once I left there. Um, anyway, uh, a couple words about it. So Smithson built it in 1970 near an old uh, oil rig site, um, which is off to the side. It usually is not in the photos that are taken, but I'll show you some uh, shots of it later. Construction took them six days. It's about 1,500 feet long, just to give you a sense of, of size, about 15 feet wide, at least when he first uh, built it. But since then, it's been, according to his plan, sinking slowly into the sand. So his, his whole idea is to create a piece of art that will slowly go away. Um, he died only a few years after, even though he was quite young. He was in his 30s um, when he put this together. He died in a plane crash, actually, um, spotting for his next uh, uh, piece of land art. And um, his uh, relatives tried to stop the spiral jetty from sinking for a few years. Um, so they sent people out with little toothbrushes um, to clean off all the sand that was forming around the spiral jetty. An injunction was leveled against them. Um, and uh, the uh, other people who were sort of pro Smithson's vision won out um, so that in fact the spiral jetty will sink into oblivion within the next uh, probably 10 years or so. Um, that becomes an important part of what Smithson is all about, and I'll also talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But, but also this idea of the pilgrimage, this idea of having to really work to see this piece of art, and this piece of art being in a place that not only is free, but um, you know, comes with no walls around it or anything, was part of Smithson's notion of challenging and interrogating the space of what we usually can, and the commerce of what we usually think of as the museum or the gallery space. So at certain times of the year, as you can see here, the water turns a very weird color. It's a kind of red, almost like wine or blood. Um, that's because the algae in the water, which thrive on the 27% um, salinity of the Salt Lake's um, north arm, turn, turn this color. And um, Smithson loved that. When he was doing flyovers of areas looking for a place to, to um, build this, he saw that red color in the water and fell in love with it. And he said it was, it was like suddenly living in a novel by J.G. Ballard, um, this crazy, weird desert landscape, no sense of a city, no sense of any civilization for 16, 20 miles away. And then you get this incredibly blood red lake. Um, it's, it's this crazy dreamlike place. But it also is always in flux. So this looks like water here. But in fact, the water level is always rising and, and falling. The light is always changing. What you're looking at here is a time when the jetty has actually, or the water has pulled back from the jetty, and you're seeing wind patterns on the sand around it. Um, the idea being that you can't come to the same jetty twice. You can't experience this experience twice. It's always going to be uh, a new place, and, and that's something um, I think um, Nietzsche would have admired as well. But I'll just take you through a slide or two to show you um, the area. It's, it's amazing landscape. 
And the spiral shape was of critical importance to Smithson's work and thought. It's the visual relative of the labyrinth, so that, that idea of the labyrinth. And the labyrinth itself is an archaic symbol of meditation, of spiritual evolution, of a journey from one world to another world. Um, and uh, this is, oh, and this is an aerial view. Um, you can see the spiral jetty just over here. Um, as you take, and you can see the water, the blood red water here, the regular lake here, and the water having uh, pulled back, and this sort of beaten up dirt road that goes out to the, to the jetty, or uh, roads a very strong <coughs> road where it is. Um, and as you leave Salt Lake, if you're flying to LA or San Francisco, or Seattle, the plane banks to the uh, west, and those on the right-hand side know to look out the window and see what's up with the spiral jetty. Um, also, as animals can't come down, um, they die in the salt, um, and because they drink the water, and that's, that's filled with salt, and things don't go well for them. Because the salt's there, their bodies are perfectly maintained, um, right? So they're sort of mummified, and um, so as you go down into the jetty, um, there are corpses all around uh, of deer, of snake, of birds, and so on that have been collecting there since the, the jetty was uh, put together. And this leads to the second um, crucial idea for Smithson, the idea of what he calls intropology. Um, intropology is a neologism um, that he borrowed from Claude Levi-Strauss, and the word for Claude Levi-Strauss held within itself the idea of entropy, the idea of things wearing down on the one hand, and anthropology, the uh, uh, study of cultures on the other hand. And anthropology, Levi-Strauss asserts in a world on the wane, quote, should be the word for the discipline that devotes itself to the study of the process of disintegration in its most highly evolved forms. Um, Smithson didn't conceive of this notion of anthropology in a negative sense, that sense of, of wearing down and so on. Um, a sense of sadness and loss. But rather for him, uh, anthropology embodied the astonishing beauty inherent in the process of wearing out, of undoing, of continuous decreation at the level not only of geology and thermodynamics, but also of complete civilizations and ultimately of individuals within those civilizations. And that leads me to my novel theories of forgetting which is composed of three narratives. So the first narrative involves the story of a middle-aged filmmaker whose name is Alana. And she's working on a short experimental video about the jetty. Okay? She lives with her husband in, in uh, Salt Lake. The second involves the story of Alana's husband, Hugh, um, and his slow dispersal, for want of a better word, throughout Europe and across Jordan on a trip there both to remember and to forget in the aftermath of Alana's unexpected death. And his vanishing is linked to a group called the Sleeping Beauties, and the Sleeping Beauties is a rising global religious cult that worships barbiturates. Um, somebody had to. Um, and the third narrative involves the story of their daughter, Isla. And Isla is an art critic and conceptual artist living in Berlin. And her narrative is, takes the form of, of parasitic marginalia um, that she writes around a manuscript that her father has produced. And um, you should know that her, her writing, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but in the novel, is written in an ink the color blue of the Great Salt Lake on a sunny day, but I'll, I'll talk about that too uh, in, a little, in a little bit. So each of these narratives has its own unique form and texture. Uh, Alana's takes the shape of a diary collage containing photographs and drawings and newspaper clippings and meditations on Smithson's Hoover with which she becomes increasingly obsessed. Hughes is a more conventional third-person narrative, and its voice is numbed and disoriented in the wake of, of Alana's uh, death. But also, each page of the novel is divided in half, okay? And I, uh, I'll show you a, a slide in just a second of that. But um, one narrative runs across the top of the novel from the beginning to the end. The other narrative runs upside down 
um, from you know the end to the to the uh, beginning, or from front to back and back to front. However, um, so in a sense, then one could say the structure of the novel suggests a spiral, and then the daughter Isla's text hovers in the margins of of Hugh's uh, narrative. So I'm also interested then in the idea of the materiality of the page. And I've, I've become increasingly interested over, over the years in that. You know, we usually read pages, as, as you know, as sort of invisible windows into fictional worlds. And what I'm interested in is defamiliarizing the reading process and making the strangeness of reading, and hence of meaning making, um, strange again, making reading into an always other that is other, not other, and not not other. Um, that very strange, like if you become conscious of what it is to actually sit down and hold a book and begin to read it, it is one of the strangest experiences um, in the world. And I, I just want to sort of accent that. Um, oops. So at the very moment in our culture then when the book has begun to dematerialize, uh, you know, with Kindles and iPads and so on, um, what I'm really interested in is rematerializing it um, in investigating what books can do that other data delivery systems can't. Um, and it seems to me um, they have a leg up in all sorts of interesting ways and also that other things are developing around it that are, are extraordinarily interesting. But the books can do certain things that other, other modes can't. So if you pick up a copy of Theories of Forgetting, you won't be able to locate a front cover. Um, instead, you'll see two back covers. Um, this totally freaks out bookstores. We're, we're always getting calls that um, they sent uh, the publisher sent a damaged lot, um, and and it's kind of fun to watch people. Um, uh, there's some copies up here if you want to take a look. The, uh, try to deal with that because people really want beginnings, um, and and so there's there's a lot of this sort of thing that goes on. Um, and, and by the way, I have brought copies of some of my books, and you're just welcome to them. They're, these are just extra copies, so take them um, afterwards if you're, you're interested. Um, in any case, the, so the reader has to constitute, because depending on which way you pick it up, you're going to hit the first narrative, right? But the first narrative will be different if you pick it up one way versus the other. So the reader has to, to choose what constitutes the privileged narrative, and that becomes important in the reading process because there are contradictory facts in the two narratives. And, it, and you tend to privilege the facts that you see first. So the facts that you come across in the first narrative will shade the second, or, or vice versa, depending on, on how you uh, look at things. Okay. So, um, so I laid out each page myself, and, and one of the reasons I did, and no two pages are the same, and one of the reasons I was doing that was because I was very interested in the idea of not only of writing a book, but of really building a book and, and exploring this notion. It has a long, long history of the material, you know, this, this um, exploration of materiality. And you, can, you can think back to books like um, Tristram Shandy in the 18th century who were playing, you know, with page layout. Um, but I really wanted to think about the idea of building books. And um, so if you look here, you'll see some sort of Trump Loy stuff that goes on in some pages. We're looking at Alana's right now, a narrative dominating the, the upper part of the page, um, her diaries and stuff she's collected. Um, if you flip the page around, you see Hugh's uh, section, and that's in a kind of typescript because it was a manuscript that he'd done. And you'll see Isla wasn't interested in her father's manuscript. She was interested in words in that manuscript that spoke to her. And so what she does is to bracket words throughout the manuscript that sort of trigger um, memories and associations for her that are important, that have nothing to do with what's going on in the plot. And then she starts generating her own meditation off in, in the margins in um, the blue script uh, here. So let me go ahead and pause for a second and read the opening to Hugh's section just to give you a sense of, of what's going on. And remember, Hugh is, is the husband in this. Um, Alana has died unexpectedly, and she's fallen prey to a pandemic called the frost. And the frost um, includes symptoms like an increasing sensation of actual coldness and a growing sense of amnesia. Um, Hugh has lost his house, you should know. 
uh, in Salt Lake City um, for various reasons, including you know the economic collapse. Um, but that doesn't prevent him from visiting the house he's lost um, on a regular basis, even though somebody else is now uh, living there. Uh, he just waits until that person is asleep. And then the man opens his eyes to find himself standing at the kitchen island. He is studying the cereal bowl on the granite countertop before him through light textured like the static on a rabbit-eared TV set. It must be morning. Four, four thirty, that's what he would guess. The cereal bowl, black, black, or gray, is half full of granola, and the man realizes there is something in his left hand and something in his right. An open carton of strawberry yogurt, a spoon with aerodynamic design. To the best of his knowledge, he is making breakfast. This thought happens to him, and the man hears a noise and raises his head. He thinks cat before he remembers there isn't any cat, before he remembers there was no cat, but maybe now there is. A few seconds, and he settles on the idea of floorboards adapting a breeze bothering things outside, even though it is summer and he knows there aren't many breezes at this time of day, at this time of year. He scoops the yogurt from the carton into the bowl and stirs the granola from the bottom up. On the counter beneath the paper towel holder is a large fruit dish, except it is a different one, chrome grid, not glossy Norway maple, maple or maybe it was fir, with different kinds of fruit in it. A pale white apple, which would appear green in daylight. One orange, which the man picks up, palms, sniffs, puts back down. Two bananas, one splotched with biomorphic stains, and he chooses the other. Opening drawers, closing drawers, opening drawers, he locates the silverware and selects a knife, a steak knife. No, just a regular blunt end one with which he cuts up the peeled banana over the yogurt and granola and listens to the wet sound of slices clicking into the mix. This is when he becomes aware of the spiky scent of ground coffee. He discovers a coffee maker beneath the cabinets near the microwave and the machine must be black because it blends in almost entirely with the countertop. He can see it, and then he can't, and then he can. The one they had was black too, no, brushed aluminum. He would figure two tablespoons of ground beans in the wire mesh filter. He would figure the timer was set last night. This thought happens to him and the man hears someone take a quick breath across the room, and he raises his head. A stranger suspended in the doorway between the hall to the bedrooms and this place, the one the man finds himself occupying. He is in the process of lifting a spoonful of granola and yogurt and banana slices to his lips, semi-thinking about how a glass of orange juice would taste good with it possibly recalling and possibly misrecalling seeing a carton on the shelf in the refrigerator among the calamity of white light, possibly behind a yellow plastic mustard bottle, a pickle jar with two pickles in it wafting in cloudy pea-green brine, an open can of peaches and sugar water covered loosely with a sheet of saran wrap. A woman, the woman, she is scrutinizing the stillness the man has become. He wonders if she can really see him, or if she can only sense the accumulation of his body in space, the certain density, second sight. Should he remain motionless, continue eating? She is smallish and several years older than he is, and maybe she wears glasses, and maybe she has left them on the bedside table when she got up to investigate the noises coming from her kitchen, his kitchen, her kitchen. It used to be his, now it is this gray hair, this shoulder-length gray hair, and he thinks, 
kindergarten teacher in a pink quilted robe. He thinks, I can easily take her. He feels rather than sees her part her lips to speak and recalls he is wearing a t-shirt, a plain white t-shirt and saggy warm jeans and a pair of new white sneakers. The t-shirt and sneakers glow in the dimness, giving away his position, and she is saying, you're doing exactly what here? She adds something he can't make out. What, he says? The noise, she says. Her voice is younger than she looks, someone in her 30s, 40s. I'm not the noise, he says, you're the noise. I hear things, she says, I come out to check, only there's never anything. She is holding an object in her hand, a modest pistol, what they call, what is the word, a subcompact, with names like Bobcat, Cobra, and the way she enunciates makes him wonder how many bridges and crowns and caps have reorganized her mouth. The pistol is pointed at him. I'm thinking mice, she says, squirrels, animal sounds, I'm thinking Maybe my house wears down around me a little every time I go to sleep. I know it does, but I'm thinking maybe I can actually hear it as it's happening. No, he decides, a pack of cigarettes. It's been months, she says. How many months has it been? No, a pistol. When did you buy, he says. Buy the house, he says. When did you buy the house? You're asking me the questions, she says. I'm asking you the questions. They are both quiet. He recalling his dentist once explaining to him that teeth are perpetually adrift in your gums, migrating and modifying continuously no matter who you are, what you try to do about it. Three months, she says, three and a half. No, a cell phone. Three and a half, he says, fine, six, seven, it's April, right? He steps over to the sink, spoons the contents of the black or gray bowl down the drain, flips on the water, the garbage disposal, flips off the garbage disposal, the water. You just come in, she says to his back, you just do this. I don't take anything, he says. Food, she says. You take food, and then what? You eat, clean the plates, put them away? What sort of burglary is this? The man dries the bowl and spoon with a luminous dish towel on the front of the stove front, replaces the bowl in the cabinet, the spoon in the drawer. I eat off plates you've eaten off, she asks. Adds, the doors are locked, the windows. The one that looks onto the deck, he says, facing her again, leaning back against the granite countertop. The lock only feels like it locks. You know this, she says. The catch, he says. He is moving effortlessly, her kitchen, his. He squints and she grows younger, squints and she grows older. He experienced the same effect when he hovered over her sleeping body in her bed. Her face kept changing. He couldn't get over it. Her face kept becoming other people's faces as he watched. He remembers being mildly impressed by the resonance, the tenacity of her snore. It wasn't loud, just persistent. She had a white scar over her left eyebrow suggesting a grain of rice or a flatworm. He can't make it out now, which is when he becomes aware that the light surrounding him is resolving toward, what is the word, legibility. The light surrounding him is resolving toward legibility, colors rising out of the room's complex aspects. No, her robe isn't pink. It is a difficult shade of blue, blue or gray, but not pink or quilted. Terry cloth, the word for what it is is terry cloth. He wants to say the woman is wearing matching slippers and all at once she isn't suspended anymore. She is planted on the floor just like he is planted in this room, this neighborhood, speaking to him like he is speaking to her. I've already called the police, she is saying. 
just so you know. Do you like the house, he asks. Before I came out, she says, from the bedroom. It's character, he asks, he says. What do you think of its character? They'll be here any minute, she says, like on one of those reality cop shows. And it's June. June, he says. I'm a florist, she says. I make flowers look flowery. I bother exactly no one. What have I got you could possibly want? Her face, he sees, she is wearing a surgical mask. No, that was someone else. I love its attention to detail, he says. You don't get that anymore, do you? The 20s, the 30s, but not these days. Crown moldings, wall niches, the, what do you call them, horribles. Not in this price range, anyway. He sees the woman's cell phone is on, a fuzzy, radiant phosphorescence meaning the line is open, meaning somewhere out there a 911 operator is listening in on their conversation, reporting, evaluating, which is when he understands he no longer has anything to add. He does have something to add, and then he doesn't, and in a quick, relaxed series of gestures, he pivots, cuts across the kitchen, unlocks the sliding glass door, glances back at the woman who is now raising the phone to her ear and parting her lips to speak. See you soon, he mouths, models her a smile, and steps through. Oh, and this is uh, another page from the novel, just to give you a sense, but I think you're, people are passing the novel around so you have a sense already that this is just Hugh's section and, and um, Alana's upside, upside down. Okay, so um, moving on then to the, the next step, which is the novel you can, can walk through. So in Theories for Getting, as you're reading along, at one point you come across a URL to the short experimental video that Alana made about Smith's and Spiral Jetty. And if you type that URL into your browser, you actually can watch her, her video. So my partner, Andy, who's sitting right over there, uh, and I began to think about how my novel could spill further out from its binding and confuse itself with the world of the event, become, in a sense, its own other. Um, and the idea arose for there's no place like time. So Andy's a, a filmmaker as well as um, um, somebody who works with assemblage and um, other sort of computer manipulated images and so on. But we, we come up, came up with this idea of inventing a retrospective for the videos Alana made through the course of her career. So in other words, making the videos Alana, my character, would have made. And through those, beginning to create a space where audience could infer Alana's growth as an individual, who she was, what her obsessions were, and so on. So in other words, there's no place like time grew into a real space dedicated to a retrospective of a fictional character's project, and ultimately an extended problematization of historical knowledge, as we've been, been talking about. And one manifestation of there's no place like time um, as I mentioned, showed in November at a place called the Greenhouse, which is a gallery uh, in Berlin. And so I want to talk with you a little bit about that, explain it, and, and maybe show a little bit from it, too. Um, so in addition to Alana's existing videos, there is a list of those videos that no longer survive, and there are various objects that appeared in some of the videos. Um, and there's also a full-length catalog. There are copies up here if you want to take a look. I'll show you a couple pages. Um, made up of critical meditations, critical essays, poetry, and lyrics by those artists and critics and friends who knew her, some of whom actually exist in our world, although I wrote their um, essays and poems and so on for them, and some of whom uh, don't. And this is the, the space of the greenhouse in line with her, her videos. Now, there's no place like time one learns from the catalog doesn't play, take place now. Uh, in March 2016, but rather in the future, in 2018. Okay, so it's, it's a show that's actually, as you step through the door, going on two years from now. So in a way, you can think of it as a speculative fiction 
that you walk through, or a science fiction that you walk through. <coughs> and um, as with Theories of Forgetting, I, I laid out uh, the catalog as, as well as wrote it. Um, and you're invited to experience this space, um, this three-dimensional novel, any way you'd like, any order you'd like, as much as you like, inferring as you go along who Alana was, who she might have been, and her relationship with her equally reality-challenged daughter, Isla, that Berlin art critic and conceptual artist I mentioned, who in a sense curates this exhibit and naturally, in a sense, doesn't curate this exhibit. And there are clues throughout the retrospective that it is indeed a near-future fiction. Alana, for instance, is listed as having died in 2016. And many, uh, nonetheless, many if not most of the participants who move through the show exit believing they've just attended an authentic retrospective of a flesh and blood filmmaker. We were going to, on um, the night where they have the artist talk, um, plant some people in the audience and have them raise their hands and talk about their recollections of, of Alana, but um, we couldn't get that together fast enough to, to actually pull it off. But th there's still that idea of people having come through the show and go, gosh, you know, Lana is a really interesting artist that I need to get to know better and then like. It's possible as well, given several suggestions Isla makes in her marginalia, that in fact, this is one of Isla's, remember she's a conceptual artist, that this is one of her conceptual projects. And so in a sense, it's a second or perhaps third order fiction that you're um, moving through. And so, there's no place like time is composed of hypotheses and interventions and doesn't seek to replicate, replace, or stand in for the past that never happened. Rather, it is meant, as, as we say, to problematize the very idea of pastness while inviting a kind of existential choreography, a way of moving through experience, through the complications of identity, history, genre, and textuality. So let me take you uh, just a quick moment to show you through a little bit of the website, which is associated with the ga this gallery. So what's happened is that, so we showed it in November, and then we have sort of a road show of it that we've uh, gone to uh, France and, and some other places in Germany um, and can kind of talk through the show um, because it's a big show to mount because there are a lot of screens and that sort of thing. And then when we go back to the States, we'll be showing it in, in um, uh, various cities in the States over the course of, of the next year. But also, one incarnation of it, and uh, let me see if I can, let's see how to do this. Oops, lost my arrow with this now, of course. There we go. Um, it was, turning out to be a hassle to get um, internet connection, so I just uh, have a little film of the uh, website. Um, and, but, um, so we also created a website for it, and uh, so that you can have a virtual experience of the show um, as well. And it's hosted by a gallery named Zweifel and Zweifel, and if, for those of you who know German, know Zweifel means doubt. Um, so it's, it's doubt and doubt that hosted the show. And, um, and the website has you know, an introduction that's written by Isla. Um, it masquerades as a real gallery that happens to actually exist at a location right across the street from where we're staying in Berlin, except that there's no house there. Um, so, so if people actually come to the gallery, there's nothing there. And then you can also, if, if you're interested, go up and see some of the films that are uh, there and just type in Zweifel and Zweifel. Dot org, um, and you can get a little sense of, of uh, what's going on there. And, um, and this last one, for you forgetting, we'll see in just a, a second. Um, and so I think of this as another manifestation of, you know, in a sense, all of this is sort of a spillover from the novel. Um, so there's, there's theories of forgetting, but then there's this three-dimensional novel, then there's a catalog element. Um, and then there's the, the gallery element. 
And the gallery talks about how you can apply to it, how you can submit work to it, and, and so on, but it'll go to an address that doesn't exist. Um, there's an email address that I never check. Um, there are books that you can buy, like the catalog and, and so on. And then there's the contact information. Oh, and the catalog, yeah, the catalog's sort of coming out next month. It sort of came out last year. It's sort of always coming out. <coughs> Okay, so that kind of gives you just a little sense of, of what's going on there. And then, uh, let's see, back to here, just a sec. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and finish up um, by showing you one of the films, and then we can open things up to uh, questions. And just a little bit of context for the film. So again, this is one of Alana's uh, short films. Uh, and this is both the one that has the URL to it in Theories Forgetting and also makes up part of the real-time retrospective that you can walk through in a gallery or, or meander through as a website. And Andy and I um, collaborated on it. Um, but of course, in a sense, it's by neither of us. And it's really interesting. So not, you know, when you're in this um, creative act of trying to make a film, of not making the film you would make, but making a film someone else would make. Um, and then making a film that somebody else would make when they're, say, 30 and learning the trade versus the kind of film they would make when they're 50 and have learned the trade, and then we also had that, that other layer of technology coming in our way. There's certain things you can't do with film that were made, say, in the 70s, and they have to have a certain look to them, so we also had to go back and sort of deform the films after we made them to make them look like they were appropriate for the certain years that they were made in, um, even though they were all shot digitally, to go back and make them look like they weren't shot digitally, you know, that sort of thing. So anyway, so, so you'll hear um, uh, Alana's, uh, or you'll see Alana's film that's sort of made by her. And then what you'll hear is a narration, and the narration is a, a, probably by Hugh. Um, and he's standing in front of a video monitor in the Istanbul Modern Art Museum on his way to Jordan to sort of lose himself in, in the desert. And the only thing you need to know there is that he's been, he, when he was in his house at one point, his house that was no longer his house that this woman was living in, he went into her bathroom and scavenged through the little medicine cabinet that was in there and partially just rearranged all of her stuff to disconcert her, but also um, took several of the pills that he found in vials, but it was dark and he couldn't read what any of the vials contained. So when he gets to the Istanbul Modern Art Museum, he just begins to pop the pills that he found. And so he gets sort of a new reaction every 15 minutes or so to the, to the film that he's looking at. Um, and then the second half of the film is a kind of erasure. This, this will become obvious um, as you're watching it. It's short, it's, it's, it's about eight minutes uh, long, and, and then we'll be able to uh, open things up to conversation. And now he is in the Modern Art Museum, standing in front of the video monitor. He has been standing in front of it for the last half hour. People enter the spacious white room in twos or threes, usually talking about subjects irrelevant to the artwork around them. They wander from object to object, barely stopping long enough to become aware of their presence. 10 seconds, 20, paying the man in front of the video monitor no attention, then wandering into the next spacious white room. Sometimes they speak English flexed with enigmatic accents. Sometimes they speak languages that sound like those heard in dreams. The man can't take his eyes off the screen in front of him. In the video, a plump woman with bobbed black hair crawls on her hands and knees through an airy modern apartment, kissing everything in her path. She kisses every article, every surface, leaving a mosaic of Marilyn Monroe red lipstick traces behind her. She wears a skimpy maid's costume, black with white lacy trim, 
the sort you buy in an adult boutique, and shiny black fuck me pumps. She kisses every inch of the glass coffee table, the glass candlesticks atop it, the blocky glass ashtray, the table's brushed bronze legs, the book whose cover is a photograph of the bridge the man stood on that morning. She kisses the streamlined white couch, the tall rectangular white lamp on the glass side table, the glass side table, the white chair, both white chairs, one on either end of the coffee table. Periodically, she pauses to apply more lipstick. Then she carries on. She kisses every leaf on the large rhododendron in the corner. She kisses a vast white wall, moves to the window flooded with white light, moves back to the wall. The video runs without dialogue, without music. There is no soundtrack except for the small raspings parts of her make as she traverses the apartment, her apartment, he would imagine, and sometimes her breathing, sometimes the kisses themselves. Every so often the camera draws in for a close-up of her profile as her lips touch something, and then the camera pulls back again. The feeling is like watching porn in slow motion. The feeling is unlike anything. It is like experiencing pure time. It is like what a minute feels like. The more the man looks, the more he sees. Nothing is going on in it save for this woman in a skimpy maid's outfit crawling through her apartment. And yet so much is going on it makes the man dizzy. He never realized how much energy, how much concentration it takes to see something. Each pill he swallows tints the video with a different effect. Maroon, tan, white with blue specks, elliptical, pentagonal, kidney-shaped. Now and then he locates a detail he hasn't located before, or a familiar detail from a completely novel angle. After his visit, he will return to his hotel room to take a nap. The encounter will have so exhausted him. But now, he is watching, trying to take in everything at once. He feels himself leaking into the woman's mind. The first knowledge that reaches him about it is that she isn't thinking about anything. He finds this a relief. She has a specific job to do, and she is doing it. Her movements are methodical, reverent. Her name is Alara. No, it is Arika. No, it is Layla. Let's call her Layla. Layla's knees are killing her. Fist-sized dark bruises will cover them for weeks. Here, however, she resists allowing the pain to seep up into her expression. Instead, she loses herself in each epiphanic kiss, cherishes every plane, texture, the idea of being deep among the thinknesses of the world, and marking every one, like a male dog, only with her lips. Inside her head, she is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Inside her head, she is saying, this is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine, too. Be aware. 10 seconds, 20. Time flexed with language. Hair crawls on every surface. Bronze book. Angular glass. Rhododendron wall music. Imagine breathing kisses. Feel anything. Crawl through the man. Realize how each swallow pecks a kidney. Take the encounter. Exhaust him. Feel him linking knowledge. Is that out? His moment is killing her. Bruise forever. This is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine too.
So let's go ahead and, and just, uh, oh, okay, like this. Um, and open things up to questions or comments or anything you want to talk about. One at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm being overwhelmed. <laughs> I teach, I can outweigh all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that um, the pure purest of forgetting. Yes. You explored the ways how story can be told um, only on the paper, mm -hmm. only via printing it. Yes. And, like the uh, electronic versions won't feel the same. Yes. So that's. I, that's the one way how um, it can be changed. How do you think about the um, books like Destroy This Diary and some this kind? Like, it's a book for you to write. It's only the outline. Well, I, I love the experiments that are going on right, right now. Um, in the, I'm, I'm thinking about how to answer. So in, in the 1990s in the, in the US, there was a big resurgence of what's called the book arts movement. And the, the book arts movement was, in essence, exploring just what we're talking about. Um, books that think of themselves as these embodied artifacts um, that are produced for, in, in great quantities and so on, um, but that are um, themselves gorgeous things, material objects, right, and exploring the materiality of those. Um, University of Utah, where I teach now, has one of the biggest collections of art books in, in the United States. And so when I came there, I sort of got infatuated with that, as well as I've been very interested in hypertext when it was starting to come online in, in the very late 80s and early 90s. And that tension that, that like, what was everybody was predicting in the early 90s, what was going to happen was the material book was going to go away and it was going to be supplanted by stuff like hypermedia, by stuff like, you know, um, hypertext and, and by, you know, what would become Kindles and all that stuff. But that isn't in fact what's happened. What's actually happened is been this very interesting sort of bifurcation where the, the um, narrative at, at one level has sort of moved into the world of, of bytes, right, through through video games and that sort of stuff. But the book itself has become even more bookish. Um, and and through through the invention, or not the invention, but the, the investigations of, of the book artists. And then you started having these crossovers in the very late 1990s and early 2000s by people like Daniel Lusky in House of Leaves where you're getting like this trade paperback, so it's produced for a fairly large number of people, but the technologies have come online now and to be able to make books do things that they couldn't have done before in fairly large quantities. And so, so Theories for Getting, for instance, is a book that I laid out in InDesign, which wouldn't have been an option, a technical, uh, technological option, um, in the, uh, say, early or mid-1990s for just people to buy and begin to build books out of. And so it's been this very interesting thing that, that this book has become more bookish precisely because the technologies um, that are made for digital realm have become available. So, so I'm really interested in that space, and I'm really interested to go to your question and think about how books, how to say this, sort of metaphorize the reading process and, and foreground the reading process in ways that it hasn't been foregrounded before, but getting to essentially the same place that, or the same kinds of questions we may have asked before. So let me give you an example. So, so when you're talking about a book where you're, you're helping write the book, for instance, something like that, that's simply raising a metaphor that is in fact the case anytime you read a book, right? Um, that is to say, any time you read a book, you are co-writing that book. Um, you're, you're remembering sequences that may have happened. If, if you wait 20 years, you're also probably remembering sequences that didn't happen. Um, and, and, um, and that when you talk to other students 
um, or, or you know, friends about a book that you've read. It's just this very weird zone you get into because people can't actually keep a whole book inside them. So you're remembering this, I'm remembering that. Um, a lot of times you have a reaction to this, I have a different reaction to that. And so there's a space in, in which it is, in fact, very much the case that we always are always reading different books. Um, and a book like you mentioned actually brings that to, to the fore. And I think um, what I wanted to do was to investigate that in, in a related way in Theories of Forgetting by creating a space in which there are literally two narratives with conflicting information in them. So even if you remembered everything correctly, you would realize that if you read one narrative, Alana's narrative, that's going to completely color the way you read Hugh's narrative, or if you flip it around, Hugh's is going to completely um, you know, uh, color the way you read Alana's. And I'm really interested in that idea of meaning making. That we read the world, right? The world is another book. The world is another text. And every time we walk through the world, we read it. Every time we read it, we create meaning in our, you know, through our own sort of contexts. Um, and every time we do that, we tend to not think about it. Um, and I, I'm really interested in books that continuously have us think about it. Um, so that was a very long-winded answer to a very short question. But I'm, I'm really interested in, the, in that zone. And there are just you know, amazing books out there now that, because of the technologies, couldn't exist, but also because of the work that's being done in art books couldn't, couldn't exist. Um, and so we're at an incredibly exciting time. The, the only downside in the U.S., and I'm, I'm imagining it may be the same in Poland, it's becoming slowly the same way in Germany, is that nobody can make money off of their books anymore, right? So, except Stephen King. Um, and so there's a whole sort of um, beginning of a change, and um, Pablo mentioned that I'm associated with a press called FC2 that's trying, and has been for 40 years now, trying to devise new ecologies of commerce so that Money doesn't become the reason that you build books. Um, other things become reasons that you build books. And um, um, the, the, what's happening right now is, at first, people thought that was going to shut down creativity. But in fact, it's exploded. You know, poets have not been able to make money for like 200 years. So they, they're like totally comfortable with this. It's like, yeah, I never could. I never will. That's fine. Um, fiction writers were like stunned 20 years ago. To, to look and go, oh, there are like 12 people who make money in the U.S. off of their, uh, off of their fiction. Um, what do the rest of us do? And instead of going, well, I'm never going to write fiction, what they did was to say, oh, now anything goes. Because now I'm writing the book I want to write instead of the book that the market is dictating that I write. Um, so it, it's an, an incredibly exciting um, time to both be a writer and to be a, a critic, a reader, um, somebody who's, who's enjoying all this stuff. Now, yeah. I have a question. Because I, of course, on the one hand, you know, books like that, or House of Lees, or Danielewski's new project, which is 27 volume, yeah. that's going to come out every six months, so that's 13 years in the making. Uh, of course, on the one hand, they mark the sort of return of the book as an object, as a form, with a vengeance, even. But on the other hand, of course, preparing, as you say, building a book does not require the same skills as it did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Because apart from all these ideas, and including visual ideas, you also need to have certain skills that are very much mm -hmm. part of this new media landscape. Like using InDesign yeah. is not intuitive. Mm -hmm. right? You have to learn it. So you know, I, was, I was wondering if you could comment on to what extent this also changes the craft of writing, which is no longer writing. It's Programming, coding, uh, designing, and right, designing websites, and, and all that at the same time, and, and working on films and so on. Um, the okay, <laughs> this is a very large statement, but it will become more precise in just a second. There are two ways to look at history. Okay, um, <laughs> um, when you're looking back at at, at uh, literary history, right? One of them is a series of continuities, and you, what you do is you track continuities through history. The other is to look at disruptions or, or ruptures in, in the historical field of, of literature. And um, so the way I was talking about responding to the book, 
um, was emphasizing the notion of continuities, that, that we go back and there's a very long history, for instance, of art books. One thinks of William Blake, right? Or there, there is a long history of books that play with design, we think of Tristram Shandy. And so at the, on, the, on the one hand, we think, oh, well, people have been doing this for a really long time. But, but what Pavel's raising, which is, is probably the more interesting question, is, but there are these ruptures that happen that change everything at certain times. And at, in the States, if you teach a course on the avant-garde, one of the history of the avant-garde or the history of experimentation or whatever you want to call it, all those words are wrong for, for a multitude of reasons. They're very problematized sort of words. But if you go back and do that, what you really see yourself doing is teaching the history of ruptures. Um, and so, so you teach Tristram Shandy or you teach Cervantes instead of, of the novels that were selling around it. Um, and then you teach, you know, James Joyce's Ulysses, and then you teach House of Leaves, or then you teach um, a hypertext, and so on. And, and what's interesting, this goes to your question, is exactly the irony in that you couldn't have produced a book like Theories Forgetting or There's No Place Like Time as materially invested as, as they seem to be without an immense knowledge of, not an immense knowledge, but a, a pretty large knowledge of technologies, of film technologies, um, you know, how to make a film look like it was created in 1978, of um, you know, uh, HTML, but also of, of other sorts of programming to create a website to make it do what you want, um, to also write the book, but then to lay it out. And what I'm involved in at the University of, of Utah is a PhD program in creative writing, which is still a very strange idea in, in the US. So we used to have these things called MFAs, Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. And that was about a two-year program, and people went in and came out with, with what is grimly called a terminal degree, in the sense that it was the last degree you would get before you, you went out. Okay. Um, and, and that there's a very vibrant MFA scene in the, in the US. It's a post-war scene, started in the 1940s. Um, primarily in this place called Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop, and then now there are over 350 of them throughout the states. What we were interested in doing was something different. That's a kind of studio model of what creative writing is. So you go in every week, you write your story, you sit around a table with 12 other people, and you critique each other's work. Okay? And there's a teacher who is sort of takes the place of the wise man. Um, who, who then will tell you what is right or wrong about all your critiques. What we wanted to do at Utah was create a different kind of space. And so what we did was to create a space where you've already had your MFA, you've already had an MA in Lit, and you hopefully have a background in something else. Maybe it's music, maybe it's film, maybe it's um, uh, computer design or something like that. And we try to uh, bring these people in and to do a PhD that's a standard sort of theory lit PhD, so you'll be doing, you know, history of theory, you'll be doing history of, of narrative, um, that sort of stuff. But you'll also be bringing in the creative uh, writing, and you'll also be bringing in uh, stuff like book arts because we have that big collection and so on. And then we mix it all together in the classroom and see what happens. And the idea, and this, this goes to Pavel's question, is trying to create a space that feels like writing the contemporary now, as opposed to a space that would feel exactly like writing the contemporary 40 years ago or 80 years ago. And, and the problem that I introduced to my students um, in, this, in this creative writing atmosphere is how does one write the contemporary rather than rewriting the past? And the answer is everybody's going to do it differently, Everybody's going to come up with their own sorts of solutions, but the more sort of invested interest and knowledge we have about the largest literary um, landscape, the theoretical, the, the, the notions of narrativity and poetics and technologies, the more answers we can come up with and we'll always surprise ourselves. So, you know, we may have, like I had one student who wrote her, um, Oh, actually, let me tell two of them. These are the weirder ones. But one student who wrote her um, dissertation on glass, and it was a, a series of glass panels, 
And, um, and then she broke each glass panel and put it in a box um, without telling her uh, professors or um, her fellow students. And so as we open the boxes, her broken narratives, which are extremely dangerous, um, <laughs> fell out. And um, we had to deal with that. Um, that just seems like amazing to me. But she had to learn how to engrave glass, and she had to cut glass, and she had to search out certain kinds of glass. And she was actually interested at one point in binding glass, like, like creating a, a book bind, binding for glass. Um, someone else went in, so, okay, slightly aside, but it goes back to this question. Um, so Bill Gates tells us how to write, right? And you don't think of that. Um, you always think of writing as something that you do individually. You think of, of you know, you're expressing yourself and so on. What I always point out to my students is Bill Gates tells us what a page should look like. Um, he tells us that a page should move from upper left to lower right. He tells us what our default font styles are. Um, he tells us what our default margins are. And he's, in, in fact, producing the first several steps of a story for us, right? And so I had another um, PhD student who actually went in and um, she um, um, basically screwed around with the code in Bill Gates's, you know, program, Windows program, to make it do things that it didn't intend to do. And this was part of a, a much larger project that, that she was working on. But it was precisely to bring to the fore the idea of all the invisible constraints that cultures have imposed upon us. Not only the way we write, of course, but the way we think, the way we make meaning, the way we read our worlds, and so on. And that there's an instinct, um, a long instinct, in Western culture dis to disrupt those moments um, in interesting and, and provocative ways that, that don't just sort of like you know, surprise people, but actually illuminate some profound invisibility that has suddenly become made visible. Um, so that, so, so the, so the, the short answer is, it's, again, a really exciting time to be a writer, but to be a writer has only this much to do with writing now, and this much to do with what else is going on around it. Um, you know, the intellectual climate, the technologies, and, and uh, the history of narrative. If you don't know the history of narrative, you just keep writing the same ones over and over again. Um, and one of my other uh, very strong points is that we've been taught, all of us, in, in any culture we come from, these certain narratives, right, over and over and over again. And if you hear the same narrative from the time you're very small to the time you're whatever age you are, you begin to believe them. Right? If you hear the same narrative over and over again, you think, oh, this must be true. Um, that's the case for the way you tell a story as it is for the way you tell gender, or the way you tell race, or the way you tell um, weapons of mass destruction, which was a, a, a narrative we heard a lot, and we began to think, oh, this must be true. Um, but it's also just how, you, how stories are made, right? What their, their basic structures are, what their basic players are, and so on. And one of the things I, I, I really advocate in the space that I'm working is to try to um, take those things that you think are absolutely essential to storytelling and disrupt them in some way. And what happens, it's an experiment. I, it could fail miserably. Um, but that doesn't matter. Like, I don't even know what fail means. I think everybody should fail. But, but I, I think success has been way overrated. But, but, um, but, but at that moment, you will learn something about the nature of narrative. And that's an extremely exciting space to, to inhabit because you never, all you know is you're never going to write the same thing that you did yesterday, tomorrow. And that's, that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I would just like to add one thing because it's not an either or where you either write or you do all these flashy things. And like you say, you kind of need to do both. But also for you writing theories of forgetting, you wrote for about a year and a half and struggle with every oh, right, word, right, right, every right. line, with the rhythm. And so it starts with the core of you being the writer and then wanting to know, you know what to do with that. And you had the idea about the two mm -hmm. parallel um, uh, narratives and whatnot. But also, I, I just didn't want to get lost in that, the, this whole process of the fact that you, you know, sometimes he'll come out and I'll say, so how, how was your writing this morning? And you say, well, 
you know, I got two lines written, and the last hour and a half I put a period in and then took it out, and now it's a semicolon. So, I mean, there, there's the idea of you. Oh, really right, not, not suggesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, we, we've had this ongoing discussion for, um, I swear to God, it's been like five days about this verb, and I've had like <laughs> the worst trouble coming up with the correct verb that the sound of a uh, Ford, a Model T, makes when it's driving over cobblestones. This has been haunting me for, for so so it's 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 there's that problem as well, right? Um, but also, like when we're working together, one of the things that is invisible, okay? We've been taught the romantic myth that every artist works in his or her own studio alone for the rest of the world and alienated. And one of the things um, that we wanted to do simply by the act of collaborating is to try to bring to the fore that there's actually no such writing as uncollaborated writing, uh, right? Uh, that, that when you begin to write, you're writing with every narrative you've ever read. If you're writing a ghost story, every ghost story you've ever heard is part of the narrative that you're either writing for or against, right? But you're also writing on a computer that was designed by somebody, on a program that was designed by somebody, or you're using a pencil that was made by somebody. Um, you have to fight with your editor, you have to fight with your publisher, you have to, um, you're always in collaboration with any reader that you would ever, ever have, um, and so on. And so one of the whole ideas of, of, of collaboration is another one of those bringing, making visible what, what our culture has made invisible about the, the process of writing. Oh. You're all terribly frightened to ask another question because I'll go on for 40 minutes. Okay, I promise to make them all short now. We're in the lightning round. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> thank you very much. This is really interesting. And so I have, sort of like, I, I guess, three comments. And, and, and if you'd like to respond to them, I'd be very pleased to hear what uh, you would say. One is that, that what, what I kind of hear you saying is that, that you know, I, I mean, I'm sure sorry, someone saying that, that literature has never had its more sad In other words, Mm -hmm. What you are trying to do, it seems to me, is to uh, come up with something like conceptual literature in the sense in which there is conceptual art. I mean, that, that, that seems to be the, you know, the part of the, of the aesthetic, uh, artistic thought. Uh, so, so that, of course, makes me wonder whether, whether this is, in fact, what is happening, or whether perhaps mm -hmm. you're also running at the risk of, uh, of sort of you know, imitating the conceptual gestures in art in a way that would be not perhaps kind of inherent in the literary uh, medium itself. I, I wonder, I mean, I'm not really sure whether that, that you know, is the case or not, but I mean, I, I kind of wonder whether that, that might be a, a, a question there. And <clears throat> the other thing is that, uh, another thing is that um, um, you're kind of uh, bringing together of, of knowledge and, and unknowing, I think you said, unknowing and, and, and forgetting, um, kind of suggests because you seem to be treating them as though they were more or less the same uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And of course, that on the one hand suggests that you are offering a kind of reflection on the nature of time. I mean, this is, like, mm -hmm. I guess, the sort of, you know, basic uh, uh, ground on, on, which, on which that kind of equation is possible. And then uh, at the same time, that seems to possibly raise a question of your relationship to history. And there is a lot of you know, going back to the 70s in, in terms of visual aesthetics, for example, and so on. So, so that, that there is a kind of question about nostalgia, maybe, also. Nostalgia versus history. Is this kind of necessary, since you are, you began by talking about hist you know, historiographic metafiction, is, is nostalgia, therefore, you know, the only mode in which history can happen? And, and my final point is about a phrase that you read out, which really kind of struck me as very, um, you know, I think I'm standing out, which is, which is when uh, I think Hugh is thinking, about the contents of this woman's fridge and, and, and the words mm -hmm. are something like the calamity, um, the, actually, yes. the calamity of white life. And so that, that, you know, that, that is a sort of reference to history in some sense, in a very kind of anthropological sense. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I wonder, you know, again, whether that kind of breaks away from nostalgia or whether it's a, how, how do you think about that, you know, the position of that or the kind of function of that? Of yeah, that yeah, yeah. Oh, those are all big questions. And now I have to answer them all under five minutes. Okay, so I, I, I think um, the first thing I would say, I, uh, to your point about conceptualism, um, I think it was William Burroughs who said that um, fiction is always about 50 years behind the other arts, and 
I have a very strong sense that that, that is often the case. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it or not. Um, when you go into MFA programs um, and are aware of what people say between 22 and, and 30 are working on, a lot of it just doesn't seem to even be aware of the other arts. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's extraordinary. Like, it's, it's that idea of not even challenging themselves to become aware of that. So I think on the one hand, that is, that is in fact simply one of the challenges I'm throwing out and dealing with is this notion of how can, how can literature not be that thing that feels like it's the conservative art? Um, how can it be doing something else? I don't think my, pro okay, I think my project is both conceptual and other things than conceptual. So I, I hear the, the idea of the danger of repeating what has already been done. Hopefully what we're doing is asking questions in slightly different ways and continuing to struggle and, and move forward in, in those kinds of aesthetic terrains. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's really, I mean, another way of phrasing the question is how do you outthink conceptual art? Um, and that's an ex I don't know that you can outthink it. That's what I'm working on right now. And that's that's really that that's that's a really uh, uh, good point to bring up. As far as history goes, and the notion of of uh, nostalgia, um, I'm in in America. I, I I don't know how like tuned in you are to the politics in America right now. It's just like a nightmare. And and um, same here. Oh okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And, and, you know, uh, it, it's extraordinary. One of the, the truisms about America probably has always been true. It's surely true now in a way that it's never been true before, um, is that we have, like, zero sense of history. Um, that, that we literally either, can't, like, I mean, I could get into a long thing, but, but I, I, I teach a historical perspective on American fiction a lot of times. And the, the stuff I get back from my students about, you know, the Civil War took place in the 1960s at Columbia University. You know, it, was, it was those kinds of answers where they, they just are bizarre. You know, World War I took place in 1783. So, so it's not like close, okay? It's not like close. It's like I have no sense of what just happened. Um, and, um, and that's extraordinary to me. And I think one of the things that that is emblematic of, or, yeah, emblematic of, is my own interest in exploring this very strange space of tellings and retellings and, and um, untellings of history. Um, and also, America is really good at retelling its history over and over again, um, to sort of dodge what actually happened. You know, it, it's, it's extraordinary in our history, for instance, that there's like no slave museum um, in America, um, you know, and like that's that's just mind-boggling, right? It would be like there being no Holocaust museum um, in in Berlin, um, you know, and and it's like yeah, well there was this thing that happened, and then we move beyond it, and um, and that that's an extraordinary thing. So so while it may seem, you know old hat or something that, that, that writers have been struggling with this for uh, in the U.S. for decades and decades and decades. I think right now it's more important than ever and probably has been for the last 15, 20 years to really invest in that. But the problem with that is always nostalgia. The problem, uh, especially, in a, maybe especially in the U.S., is always this sense of um, this nostalgic version of a past that never happened and, and uh, partially silenced voices, partially that, that notion that America is so good at it, forgetting the real past and sort of retelling a different narrative, um, and so on. So it is simply just essential to how I'm thinking these days and how I'm, I'm sort of, these things are the things that I am obsessing on right now. Um, the, it's sort of the dangers of, of nostalgia. Um, and how one thinks beyond those kind of concepts, or if one can now. You know, we live in such a sort of spectacular, media-rich environment that is designed to get our sense of pastness to sort of collapse in on itself. Um, it, it, it may be a fruitless gesture, but it's one, one I'm sort of committed to right now. Um, 
but that's just skirting the surface of what, what you said, so we'll, we'll have to continue this mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah. I think we're, we're wrapping up, but any last sort of thing? Otherwise, listen, I have a couple copies of books. If anybody's interested in them, just take them. And um, I just want to thank you all for, for having come out today. This was really, really fun. Thank you.